presidents that tried have suffered severe consequences like assassination or impeachment. That all demonstrates the fact that presidents cannot control the U.S. government. In order to do so, you would need to fundamentally overhaul and reorganize the government itself. And that would require a kind of revolutionary party apparatus, a separatist reform movement that would restaff, reorganize, and completely overhaul the government as it's structured today. Welcome back to Men and the City. In today's video, we are going to talk about why the next president will fail. Abraham Lincoln once said that the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. Well, one of the persistent dogmas of our time is that elections have consequences. Indeed, this is what we are being told on a daily basis about the upcoming presidential election, that it is the most important election in our lifetimes. But any keen observer of Western politics in general, and the United States specifically, will note that in recent times, elections do not have consequences. That despite the coming and going of elected officials, nothing meaningfully changes or reforms. Well, why is that? That is the subject of today's video. I think there are three major reasons why presidential elections at this point are all but irrelevant. The first reason is control. In order for the president to exert control over the U.S. government, at a minimum, the president must control three things. I call it the triad. He must control the executive branch, the 15 some odd departments that fall under the direct purview of the president of the United States. These are departments like justice or treasury or homeland security, for example. The second leg of the triad is the military industrial complex itself. And that goes well beyond simply the Defense Department. It includes the feeder systems, the nonprofits, the think tanks, the special interests that all more or less drive our foreign policy and our national security strategy forward independently of any elected officials. The third leg of the triad consists of the intelligence apparatus. Now specifically, there are three main components. The Central Intelligence Agency, which basically operates independently. The second is the National Security Agency, which falls under the Defense Department. And the third is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, which falls under the Justice Department. Now, no president in recent history has been able to get control of the triad. And presidents that tried, presidents like JFK or Richard Nixon, and in recent years, Donald Trump, have suffered severe consequences like assassination or impeachment. That all demonstrates the fact that presidents cannot control the U.S. government. Well, the second reason why the presidential election doesn't much matter is because of breakdown. Now, what is the U.S. government today? Well, basically, it's three major programs. It's the New Deal from the 1930s, which gave us Social Security, unemployment, insurance, and food stamps. It's the military-industrial complex itself, so named by President Eisenhower, which gave us the services, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Coast Guard. It gave us the nuclear triad. And it gave us all kinds of off the book or hidden intelligence agencies and departments that haven't been controlled for decades. The third program is the Great Society. The Great Society gave us Medicare, Medicaid, housing and urban development, the Civil Rights Act, so forth and so on. Well, if you look at the budget of the United States today, what is it? It's basically those three programs. That's where all the spending is allocated. We spent about a trillion dollars a year on defense alone, and the rest of all of our revenue goes to paying for Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, which have become mandatory spending programs by law that basically eat up the entire federal budget. So that tells you 
exactly what the federal government really is. Now, what's noteworthy about those three programs is not simply the morass of agencies and departments that govern them and the bureaucracies that administer them. It's also the age of the programs. The New Deal is a legacy of the 1930s. That's almost 100 years old. The military industrial complex, as I said, goes back to the 50s and the Great Society goes back to the 1960s. So what you can observe is that the governmental structure that we currently have to deal with is breaking down because it's old, it's decrepit, it's unnecessarily large and unwieldy. But again, the President of the United States, whomever they may be, can't get control of it, can't arrest that breakdown. Now, why is that? The reason for that is because in order to do so, you would need to fundamentally overhaul and reorganize the government itself. And that would require a kind of revolutionary party apparatus, a separatist reform movement that would restaff, reorganize, and completely overhaul the government as it's structured today. Needless to say, neither candidate is proposing such a thing, and there's no promise of such a development in the near future. Which brings us to the third reason why the presidential election doesn't much matter, and that is a convergence of crises. Specifically, let's talk about the fiscal crisis. Well, we know that roughly speaking, every hundred days, the federal government is adding about a trillion dollars to the national debt. Nearly $33 trillion. That's what the U.S. national debt was as of early September 2023. At the end of July 2023, when the debt was about $300 billion less, roughly $7 trillion of that was intragovernmental debt holdings, meaning the government owes itself that money. The majority of the debt, about $25.7 trillion, was held by the public. Now, in recent years, the national debt has become irrelevant. It's ignored. Nobody seems to care. But now it matters, and it matters not simply because the government is old and decrepit and not properly administering a lot of these programs, but because interest rates are rising. In order to find enough demand for the ongoing onslaught of issuance, we're going to have to find that appropriate yield that garners added interest by investors. Where will that yield be? I can't tell you. But as you look at a chart of 10-year rates going back to the early 1960s, Going from 5% to 15% can happen pretty quickly. The interest rates themselves reflect confidence in the U.S. government, and that confidence is waning, not simply from foreigners that buy our debt, but also from domestic institutions like pension funds that are increasingly skeptical that the U.S. government will pay them back. The second crisis is a domestic, economic, and financial crisis. Well, as most of you know, in the United States today, the economy is simply not as productive as it once was. In fact, most of what's driving the economy today is government spending, which, as I said, is both inefficient and unaffordable. But the general population, the middle class, is being battered by structural unemployment because since COVID, major uh, small business investment and dynamism has completely dried up. It's died. And of course, we're dealing with the legacy of an industrial economy that has teetered, that has withered on the vine since the 1980s as the United States has deindustrialized. On top of that, we've got inflation, which is causing a cost of living crisis as we speak. The cost of groceries, of energy are rising while Americans are struggling to find jobs. So that's a domestic economic crisis that's only going to get worse and start to manifest in a banking crisis or other financial institutions that blow up as the underlying strength of the economy begins to seize up. The third crisis, and perhaps the most serious at this stage, is the prospect of very serious war with geopolitical rivals. This is manifest in tension between the United States and Russia in Ukraine, or between the United States and its ally Israel against Iran in the Middle East, or tensions between the US and China in East Asia. Tensions are rising, and as I said, because the President of the United States cannot get control of the triad, because he cannot arrest the warmongering of the military industrial complex, the likelihood that the next president can de-escalate these conflicts is extremely unlikely. 
So if you add it all up, the lack of control over the US government, the inability to arrest the breakdown of an aging structure that's almost 100 years old, depending on where you want to start the clock, and the emergent crises that are beginning to overwhelm the US government all suggest that the next president will fail. Stay tuned for more, and we'll talk soon.